doing? Oh, Tap, how's everybody doing today? All right, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is uh, Saturday, February 29th, 2020, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. So everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in. So I wanted to deal with this topic. I've been doing a lot of uh, lectures. I spoke at a lot of uh, events for African American History Month. And I wanted to deal some with uh, some of the history of African American History Month, okay? So we're gonna deal with how Black History Month, African American History Month was never designed to be the only time of the year that we study our history. Contrary to popular belief, Contrary to what you may hear at various African American History Month uh, celebrations, okay? All right, so uh, we're going to look at an article that I wrote and um, updated in February 2020. And also we're going to talk about this year's annual theme for African American History Month, which is African Americans and the vote, African Americans and the vote. Because we know that the year 2020 is the 150th anniversary of the um, ratification of the 13th of the 15th amendment okay the 15th amendment of 1870 and it was the 15th amendment that um, gu uh, guaranteed the right to vote for african-american men the 15th amendment of 1870 uh, one of the it was the last of the third civil rights uh, civil war acts the last of the third civil war acts Okay, so everybody share this uh, broadcast on your Facebook page, and I'm sharing this uh, right now. Okay, now a lot of people don't know there's an annual theme each month for Af uh, each year for African American History Month. Okay, uh, there's been an annual theme since 1928, and when I speak at a lot of uh, African American History Month events, I ask people, "What's the annual? What, what's what's this year's annual theme?" In 2019, it was black migrations. This year is um, African Americans and the vote. And the annual theme is not just designed to be celebrated during the month of February. It's a theme designed to be celebrated year round and studied year round, okay? So when we look at African American History Month, we have to talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And oftentimes, I, you know, when I speak at different events, they'll have their, their celebration and they'll talk about Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and deal with a, a lot of personalities, historical personalities, and not talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And I don't even understand how you do something like that, but okay, I guess that's what's happening. All right, so... Dr. Carter G. Woodson was born December 19th, 1875 in New Canton, um, Buckingham County, Virginia. New Canton, Virginia, which is in Buckingham County. So he's born 10 years after slavery ends, okay? And he's born to uh, former slaves, uh, James Woodson and Anna Eliza Riddle. Dr. Woodson doesn't go, he doesn't get formal uh, education until he's about 20 years old. Uh, he's going to end up getting a bachelor's of literature degree from Berea College in Kentucky in 1903. He then goes on to uh, uh, get a, another bachelor's from University of Chicago in 1907 and a uh, master's degree in 1908 from the University of Chicago. He gets a PhD in American history from Harvard University in 1912. He becomes the second African-American to get a PhD from Harvard and the first African-American of African slave descent because Dr. W.B. Du Bois, who got his PhD from Harvard in 1895, was born to free parents, okay? So Dr. Woodson is, uh, becomes an educator. He teaches at Frederick Douglass High School in Washington, D.C. He's gonna teach at uh, Howard University uh, for a year. He teaches at another uh, institution also in uh, Virginia. But he realizes that uh, African Americans don't know their history, African American children as well as adults, okay? 
Now, he's going to co-found the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which today is a solid association for the study of African-American life and history. He co-founds this September 9th, uh, 1915, September 9th, 1915. Now, 1915 is a pivotal time in the history of this country because 1915 is the um, 50th anniversary of the ending of the Civil War, which officially ends June 2nd, 1865. Then you have the ratification of the 13th Amendment, December 6th, 1865. Uh, you have the adoption of the 13th Amendment, which um, legally ends chattel slavery. So you have basically 4 million enslaved Africans who, who are set free. Um, so the 13th Amendment is, is adopted December 18th, 1865. We know the Ku Klux Klan is founded February, uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, about a week or so after the 13th Amendment is ratified. So in Chicago in 1915, there was a three-week symposium that had all types of lectures and exhibits and things like this that chronicled and documented and celebrated the accomplishments of African Americans during this 50 year period of time from 1865 to 1915. You have thousands of African Americans who come from across the country who come to this, come to this symposium. And it's gonna be there that Dr. Uh, Woodson gets the idea to create an organization that will preserve, that, that will research document, preserve, and teach the, about the history, accomplishments, and achievements of African Americans in this country, but also throughout the diaspora on the continent of Africa, in the Caribbean, et cetera, okay? So he co-founds ASALA, Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915 in Chicago. And it was just an article from, um, we posted this article from uh, NBC, I think it's NBC Chicago, dealing with the uh, formation of ASALA there in Chicago in 1915. Today is known as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And this, this organization is the governing body, basically, of African American History Month or Black History Month. So Dr. Woodson is going to... Um, in, in 1916, he creates the Journal of Negro History, which, is, which was a historical journal for African-American historians and scholars to publish our papers, because a lot of the white historical journals didn't want to publish our papers. In 1921, he uh, founds Associated Publishers, Inc. Associated Publishers, Inc. And this was a publishing company to, that published his textbooks um, and published uh, books by other scholars as well, but they also published uh, 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 published his books, but they also published textbooks for schools and HBCUs. Okay, Associated Publishers, Inc. So in 1926, he creates Negro History Week, okay? Negro History Week took place the second week in February. Contrary to popular belief, um, White people did not give us Black History Month. That's something that we created. That came out of self-determination, okay? That came out of African-Americans understanding that we need to study our history, preserve our history, and teach our history, okay? So a lot of people ask the question, well, why is, why is it in the month of February? February um, is the shortest month of the year, it's the coldest month of the year, things like this, right? Just a bunch of nonsense. So, the reason why he chose uh, February is because February contains the birth dates of uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Um, Abraham Lincoln's birthday was February 12th. Frederick Douglass, being a former slave, he didn't know his birth date. He didn't know the exact year he was born. Um, so Douglass took the assumed birth date of February 14th. Now, more importantly than the second week of February having those two birth dates, there were celebrations across the country that African Americans were having celebrating these two birthdays going back decades. So going back to when um, 
Frederick Douglass dies in 1895, African Americans were having celebrations during the second week of February to celebrate his birthday. And also uh, going back to when Lincoln was assassinated, uh, shot April 14th, 1865 at the Ford Theater. And then he dies the next morning, April 15th, 1865. So on his, uh, around his birthday, African Americans were having celebrations for Lincoln as well, going back decades. So since you already had celebrations going on during that second week in February, Dr. Woodson put his new celebration, the new cultural celebration within that period of time as well, okay? Be, so you could build on that momentum. So this is why uh, African-American History Month is in February. It has nothing to do with it being the shortest month of the year, anything like that. And as I, as I explain to people, if you just have to have 30 days for your celebration to feel legitimate, you do realize you can still celebrate March 1st and March 2nd if you just have to have 30 days, right? I mean, the whole argument doesn't make any sense, but okay. If, if, if you just have to feel legitimate and have 30 days. Now, there's a annual, there's been an annual theme for African American History Month going back to 1928. The reason why there's an annual theme is the annual theme gives purpose and direction for the monthly cultural celebration. So as I, as I explained to people, Unfortunately, a lot of these uh, Black History Month celebrations uh, get just reduced down to recycling the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year. Or just it gets uh, reduced down to just celebrating people who are acceptable to white people are not threatening things like this. And we just we focus on runaway slaves or people who invented things that make white people's lives easier. Right. Um, somebody asked about Asala. A S A S A L H dot org. Asala dot org. A S A L H dot org. Asala dot org. Okay. And then the NBC Chicago has this video here how Black History Month started and its Chicago roots. How Black History Month started and its Chicago roots. Okay. We'll post this link here. This is from NBCChicago.com. So you can check that out. All right, let's look at this uh, PowerPoint presentation. And then also we have a uh, 15 DVD bundle pack, Black History Month DVD bundle pack, which is good uh, year round, which is good to uh, study this information, watch the videos, et cetera, year round. You can use these for study groups, homeschool, et cetera. So it's 15 of my lectures. It's uh, on the homepage of our, of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We just posted the link here. So that's on sale. So like a $250 value, something like that on sale, $100. So we just posted that. Also, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Um, so yeah, asala.org. So at asala.org, they have information. They're dealing with the history of Asala. They talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, but also there is a kit there that you can order that has information about African American history month and the annual theme. And it has, uh, resources that you can use to teach this information to your children and teach this in schools also. Okay. Um, all right, so how's everybody doing? We have Judy. We have uh, Judy in Oak Park, Michigan. Shella. Uh, who else we have here? Adrian. Just a few people. Andre, Eric, Dee Dee, Carl. All right, so everybody share this broadcast. Okay, let's continue. Uh, let's look at the... PowerPoint presentation here that I have because I this is part of my presentation I've been doing for um for African American History Month and it gives some uh background information here. 
So let's flip over to this. Let's turn on the share screen so you can see this. Okay, so Dr. Woodson founded Negro History Week in 1926. He explained the reason behind the celebration in the pamphlet widely distributed months before the first celebration was to take place during the second week of February, 1926, in commemoration of Frederick Douglass's and uh, Abraham Lincoln's birthdays. He exclaimed that blacks knew, quote, practically nothing about their history. He ultimately believed that African Americans could benefit immensely from knowledge of their past and accomplishments of their ancestors. He added that race prejudice was the byproduct of whites' beliefs that black people had not contributed anything of worth to world civilization, okay? And here's his most famous book, um, probably his most famous book, The Miseducation of the Negro, that came out in 1933. All right, so Dr. Woodson argued that if the historical record was set straight, if the historical record was set straight, that, um, and, and that, and, that if the history of black people were studied along with the achievements of others in schools, not only would black youth develop a sense of pride and self-worth, but racism would also be abolished. Dr. Woodson concluded, quote, let truth destroy the dividing prejudice of nationality and teach universal love without distinction of race, merit, or rank. With, with sublime enthusiasm, in heavenly vision of the great teacher, let us help men rise above uh, the race hate of their age and unto the altruism of a rejuvenated universe. Okay. All right. So here's a picture of Dr. Woodson. And I don't see too many pictures of Dr. Woodson smiling. I've seen a number of pictures of him. I may see a quarter smile, half smile, but I, I, I've seen very few pictures of Dr. Woodson actually smiling. So Negro History Week was the first major achievement in popularizing black history and was unique in that it focused on the black youth. Dr. Woodson realized that the miseducation uh, of black people began in their homes, okay? The miseducation of black people began in uh, their homes, communities, and elementary schools. Homes, communities, and elementary schools, which is why it's important to get this information into the homes, get it to the adults, get it into the homes. Because today, I speak across the country, and in general, our people don't understand their history. Um, and, you know, I, let's see, last weekend, I spoke at three African-American churches uh, here in the Detroit area, and it's good the pastors asked me to come speak because they told me our people don't understand their history, right? And they are correct. And I'm not talking about children don't understand their history. I'm talking about grown adults, 60s, 70s, 80s, okay? So we have to understand that your thoughts create feelings, your feelings, feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. It's African history and culture that gives us our, gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. This is our foundation, okay? as Dr. Linda Jeffries and Professor James Small, two of my teachers, correctly teach us. This gives us our foundation, our values, our interests, and our principles. And this influences and drives our economic empowerment and how we engage in economics, as well as our political empowerment and how we get engage in politics. African history and culture is the foundation. So I was at, uh, so this morning, because I wanted to do this broadcast uh, earlier, but. I was worn out and I had to go to, I was on the panel discussion for grits and, grits and politics this morning um, here in Detroit at a Great Emanuel uh, Church. So the topic was the state of black politics in Michigan, state of black politics in Detroit. And one of the things that we have to understand is the reason why many of our people don't fight back or the reason why many of our people don't vote is because many of our people don't think they're worth fighting for. Many of our people, because we, many of us suffer from low self-esteem and low racial esteem because of lack of understanding of our history. 
many of us don't think that we're worth having more than what we have. Okay. So, so we're dealing with a, a, a damaged uh, consciousness and a, and a damaged self identity. And when we look at negative images of African Americans that are being marketed to us through media and marketed around the world, we can see why. This is why African history and culture is so important because our history and culture gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth, okay? Our history and culture uh, give us our foundation. All right, so this is so when we talk in in when we talk about voting, voting is extremely important because not voting is one of the ways Trump was able to get in the office. This is why Republicans had a voter suppression had voter suppression tactics that were targeting key battleground states in the 2016 election. It wasn't just Russians who we were targeted. It wasn't just Russians who had a disinformation campaign and were target, targeting us in 2016 election. It was also Republicans. You have to understand history to really understand this and understand the gutting of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act because of the U.S. Supreme Court case of Shelby County versus Holder. I, I, I did a presentation uh, this past Friday at uh, Detroit Unity Temple Church. And this is one of the things that I talked about in that presentation. I dealt with, does an amendment give you the right to vote? Because nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give the right to vote. A lot of people don't know this, okay? Smithsonian Institute has an article about this. So uh, the, 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 um, I have to put on our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, the um, presentation that I did February 8th here in Detroit for African American History Month. And it deals with this year's annual theme, African Americans and the Vote. So um, we'll make that available. We'll get that up uh, uh, the next day or so, or something like that. There's a fantastic presentation. I go deep into this information. Then I have a follow-up presentation dealing with uh, the one I just did this past Friday. Does an amendment give you the right to vote? Where I go deeper into this uh, history and information, and this deals with understanding the U.S. Constitution, understanding law, understanding the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Okay, so Dr. Woodson's vision of Negro History Week was optim optimistic, strategic, and long term. He wanted this modest week long celebration to serve as a stepping stone toward the gradual introduction of black history into the curricula of all levels of the US educational system. Because Dr. Woodson felt that the history of African Americans needed to be taught in every school across the country. Okay, not just in schools where um, we were, where we went or with a majority population. Dr. Woodson felt that the history of African Americans need to be taught in every school across the country. And he's known as the father of black history and the Father of Black History Month, okay? And he's credited with really laying the foundation to get um, African-American history taught in the curricula, taught at HBCUs, taught in, in the colleges, et cetera, okay? Um, if you like this type of information, also you could donate to the African History Network, uh, donate through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, um, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, okay? Or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, click, click on the yellow donate button. And then uh, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the third of the broadcast, email me at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Our current promotion, buy one month, uh, get two months free. All right, so let's continue here. Okay, so there's another picture of Dr. Woodson. He's not smiling at all in this picture. All the pictures I see of Dr. Woodson, he's, pretty, he's usually uh, very, very serious. Okay, he, he ain't playing around. Now, what's interesting about this period of time, okay, 1915, and here's a book, uh, 
that I have on Dr. Woodson. This is uh, an excellent book. This is written by uh, Dr. Payro Dagbovi. Dr. Dagbovi is a history professor at Michigan State University, okay? And uh, trying to, so you can see it without the glare. Um, Carter G. Woodson, in Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., The Father of Black History, okay? By Dr. Dak Bovey. And in this picture here, Dr. Woodson ain't smiling at all either, okay? And <laughs> on the back is a statue of Dr. Woodson. He's not smiling in the statue at all either. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's go back to uh, the slide here. All right, so uh, Dr. Woodson hoped that Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year, as he affirmed from time to time. He never designed this, designed this to be the only time of the year that we study our history, okay? It's supposed to be a celebration of our history, and these are things that we're supposed to study year-round. Dr. Woodson consistently instructed those observing the week that they needed to diligently prepare for the celebration months in advance and that after mid-February, they needed to continue acknowledging the role of African descendants in world history. Continuing, continue acknowledging the role of African descendants in world history after February. So when we talk about in world history, we're not just talking about from 1619 to the present in this country. We're talking about studying African people around the world and the contributions to African people throughout history, the contributions by African people throughout history. Dr. Woodson said, quote, Negro History Week should be a demonstration of what has been done in the study of the Negro during the year, and at the same time, as a demonstration of greater things to be accomplished, end quote. This is, this is what Dr. Woodson instructed teachers. So Dr. Woodson said that a subject which receives attention one week out of the 36 will not mean much to anyone. So this, uh, read, uh, Dr. Dak Bowley's book, this comes from pages 100 to 102. But Dr. Woodson felt that that second week during February or what is now African American History Month, that's a period of time that, that school children should show us what they have been studying year round, as opposed to that being the only time that we teach our history in school or something like that. The way that is being practiced largely, the way that these celebrations are taking place largely are backwards. We don't have, we don't, we haven't done the research to understand the history of the celebration. So we don't really understand how to properly celebrate it and get the most out of it. This is why they have annual themes. There've been annual themes going back to 1928 to give purpose to give direction, okay, for this celebration. So if we look at, um, and, and if we look at this uh, slide here, dealing with the pyramid principle, and this is Dr. Leonard Jeffries. So two of my teachers, Professor James Small and Dr. Leonard Jeffries, you've seen, you've heard a number of interviews I've done with them throughout the years. When they teach, they talk about the pyramid principle. So here's a pyramid, a coffre, a Giza. And the pyramid has three sides. The foundation of the pyramid is African history and culture. It's our history and culture that gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us a, a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. Our history and culture gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. You've heard me say before, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So that foundation influences our economic empowerment, how we engage in economics, the type of businesses we have, what we do with our money once we make it. 
it also influences our political empowerment. So we have a $1.3 trillion GDP, African-Americans. 97% of that is spent with people that don't look like us, largely because that foundation is not in place. We can have a $10 trillion economy. If that foundation is not in place, we'll still spend 97% of our dollars with people that don't look like us. We have a deep, rich history of economic engagement, economic empowerment through the co-ops, through the cooperatives. Dr. Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard wrote the book, Collective Courage. And that book is around here somewhere. Collective Courage, which is, um, that book deals with the history of African-American co-ops, the cooperatives. And through cooperatives, this book right here, Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. We have co-ops going back during slavery, the Free African Society of 1787. Uh, we have them after slavery, uh, the Colored Merchants Association, about 1927, 1928, which comes out of the Negro, National Negro Business League, founded in 1900 by Booker T. Washington. You have the Colored Farmers, um, the Colored Farmers uh, Union, founded in 1886 in Texas, which is gonna grow to have about 1.2 million members. But the, but the cooperatives were various types of businesses, business organizations that we had that helped our businesses, that helped us raise money. And the members were part owners also, the co-ops, okay? These, are, these principles of cooperative economics are principles we're bringing with us from Africa. And this is how we largely engaged in economics. But many people don't know that history. So that, but that, the way you engage in economics ties largely into your history and culture and your understanding of your history and culture. And then when we deal with political empowerment, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Politics is more than just voting, even though voting is extremely important because that's your opportunity to fire the people you call on the radio shows every day complaining about. That's your, that's your opportunity to fire the people who are, who are putting in place policies that do you harm. Voting is extremely important. Strategically voting, that's extremely important. But that's not all there is to politics. So the... 2019 theme for um, African American History Month was Black Migrations, Black Migrations, okay? And Black Migrations dealt with not just the transatlantic slave trade, because we know 2019 was the 400th year anniversary of August 2016-19 in uh, basically in Hampton, Virginia. It wasn't Jamestown, but basically Hampton, Virginia at Point Comfort when the white line slave ship, which was an English pirate ship, comes, uh, uh, comes in and trades 29 Africans for food supplies and water. And it's looked at as the beginning of when, when African people first came to the uh, Virginia colony. Now there were African people here long before that. If you read the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep, he deals with this. But also going back to 1526, we know that Africa, we know that the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory that we call South Carolina in 1526. This is 93 years before Jamestown, Virginia. Um, so the 1619 project came out and you know. Some of the articles were okay. There's some problems with the 1619 Project. Um, but a lot of what we thought that we knew about those first Africans coming in uh, is wrong. VirginiaMercury.com has an article, much of what we've been told about Virginia's 1619 first Africans is wrong, August 11th, 2019. 
so read that article. This is a historical marker at Fort Monroe, and it notes the arrival of the quote unquote first Africans in Virginia. This historical marker says the first documented Africans in Virginia arrived in August 1619 on the White Lion. This was an English pirate ship or slave ship. An English privateer based in the Netherlands. Colonial officials traded food for these 20 and odd Africans who had been captured from a Portuguese slave ship. The Portuguese slave ship was called the San Juan Batista. And the San Juan Batista uh, captured about 350 Africans in what's pre what is present day Angola. And then that slave ship gets hijacked around the Gulf of Mexico by two English pirate ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer. And the English pirates take about 50 Africans and put them on these two ships. And then those two ships come into Point Comfort in Virginia. Now, among present day Hamptons, among present day, uh, among present day Hampton's earliest African residents were Antony and Isabella, Antony and Isabella. Their son, William, was the first child of African ancestry known to have been born in Virginia, uh, or right around 1624. Many of the earliest Africans were held as slaves, but some individuals became free. A legal, this is, this is extremely important for people to understand because we, we don't understand this chronology of history. A legal framework for hereditary lifelong slavery in Virginia evolved, evolved during the 1600s. The United States abolished slavery in 1865. Codified slave laws didn't exist in any of the 13 colonies in 1619. You may have heard me talk about this before. The first colony to have codified slave laws was Massachusetts in 1641. They're going to come to Virginia in 1661. The whole way that this whole system of slavery in the, in the British colony evolves is different than how we actually think it, ha it happened. So when you read Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. In chapter two, he lays out a lot of this history. And a lot of these early Africans are going to be put into a form of indentured servitude for three to five or seven years and then released after that because codified slave laws don't exist at this time in 1619, 1620, 1625, in the British colonies. I'm not talking about the Spanish colonies. The Spanish get involved in the transatlantic slave trade before the English. Different European countries are getting involved at the same time. The way they engage in it is not exactly the same way as other European countries. So you have to study them indiv individually and, and, and deal with this history chronologically. But if you look at um, page, so if we look at the sixth edition of Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. In the back of the book, he has about 100 pages or so of landmarks and milestones, landmarks and milestones, okay? And it starts in 1619. And if you look at 1641, it uh, they start in December 1641 and it says Massachusetts became the first colony to give statutory recognition to slavery. Some of the articles from the 1619 project and other articles around that time in, in August uh, 2019, other articles around that time from Washington Post, things like this, and even a year or two before that dealt with how codified slave laws didn't exist in 1619. And this is going to evolve over time throughout the 1600s. But it says Massachusetts became the first colony to give statutory recognition of slavery. Other colonies followed. Connecticut in 1650, Virginia 1661, Maryland 1663. New York and New Jersey, 1664, 
South Carolina, 1682. Rhode Island and Pennsylvania, 1700. North Carolina, 1715. Uh, Georgia, 1750. So these, these slave laws and this whole system is evolving in the different colonies and they're coming to the different colonies at different times. The, the way many of us think that this whole thing evolved is not how it happened. They didn't just have a, a system of slavery that just evolved, that just happened in all the 13 colonies and just happened all at the same time. And it was, it was, it was a system that was already designed and just poof, here it is. Whoop, there it is. That's not what happened. Okay, so let's continue here. Um, let's go back to the screen share for a minute here. And this is from the, my presentation dealing with uh, Black Migration 1619 to 2019 and African Americans and the Vote. I did this presentation February 8th, 2020. Okay, so we'll have this available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Now, the Spanish were taking Africans into South Carolina in, in 1526. This is 93 years before Jamestown, Virginia. Most people don't know this. I have a whole separate presentation dealing with this. But Washington Post has this article, September 7th, 2019. Before 1619, that was 1526. Before 1619, there was 1526, the mystery of the first enslaved Africans and what became the United States. Spanish explorers brought 100 slaves to a doomed settlement in South Carolina or Georgia, because in that general area, okay? Within weeks, the subjugated revolted, then vanished. We believe they go off and live with Native Americans. We don't know what happens to them after that. But they overthrew their oppressors. This is oftentimes not talked about. This is 93 years before Jamestown, Virginia, or, or Hampton, Virginia. Then in 1513, the Spanish conquistador Juan Ponce de Leon comes into Florida, and Juan Garrido, a man born in West Africa in 1480, and man of African descent, Juan Garrido, is coming into Florida with Juan Ponce de Leon. This is in 1513, okay? This is 13 years before uh, the Spanish are taking Africans into uh, South Carolina in 1526. If you read, uh, well, uh, one, uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Gates Jr. has an article for theroot.com, uh, who was the first African American? because he talks about how that was probably the first one we know of by name, person of African descent to come to this land. And then he has the, um, that was for a series that he did uh, called 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro, okay? Which was a take on the pamphlet that J.A. Rogers put out decades ago. And each week Gates would and take one of those facts and analyze it and go deep into it, do with the history. Gates also put out this book, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro as well, which has all the articles um, that, that he wrote for The Root, okay, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro. And then in the, um, in Gates, one of his other books, African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross, just bear with me. I have four stacks of books next to me. I'm trying to find that. Um, his other book, African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. Oh, it's down further in the stack. I can't get to that. That uh, African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross was the companion book to the six-part series that came out in 2012 on PBS. Okay, and in that one, in the introduction, oh, I think in chapter one, around page three or four, he talks about Juan. Pon he talks about uh, Juan Garrido also. Okay, 
So a lot of people don't know this history. So they hear 1619 is when we first came to this land. I'm like, no, that's not true. For a number of reasons, it's not true. Okay, let's continue here. So the 2019 theme for African American History Month was black migrations. And it wasn't just looking at the transatlantic slave trade, but it was also specifically looking at the great migration of basically 1915 to 1970, where you had about 6 million African Americans migrating from the South up North and out West, and it totally changes this country. So when we deal with Dr. Carl G. Woodson, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, uh, in 1915, Negro History Week, 1926. We're doing, this is at the beginning of the Great Migration. Um, this is after World War II in 1926. After, I'm sorry, after World War I, World War I, 1914 and 1918. So you have all this taking place. And then you have the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, in the 1920s, things like this, uh, in, in the teens, late teens and, and 1920s. So all this taking place around the same time. You have the Red Summer of 1919. Um, the, the Red Summer is the year after World War I ends. And you have uh, over 25 major race riots in this country. Washington, D.C., New York, uh, so we Washington, D.C., Elaine, Arkansas, New York City, um, and you have, uh, um, you have a lot of former World War I veterans who are coming back home with a new sense of pride, new sense of dignity, and you had, they were known as race men, and also you had this new concept called the New Negro, and these brothers are coming back home saying, we're not going to deal with the same racism and segregation and Jim Crow laws, things like this, that we dealt with previously we want all of our rights now okay we want all of our rights now so you're going to have these racial explosions because what happened was the world war one really kicks off the great migration now you're going to have african americans migrating before then out of the south because uh in 1900 at the turn of the century uh 90 percent of african americans lived in the south okay but because uh, of, of uh, job openings at factories up north, especially during World War I, because uh, in World War I, you have about 5 million men who go fight in World War I, about 340,000 or so are African Americans. When these white men go fight in a war, they left jobs behind. Those jobs were filled uh, by African Americans and immigrants who were here. It was a huge labor vacuum. So when these white men come back home, they can't find work. And this explodes into racial explosions across this country. And a lot of these brothers who served in the war, they learn how to fight, how to shoot. They're defending their communities. They're out in the streets in their World War I uh, uniforms, out in the streets with their rifles that they brought back from the war, things like this, right? And there was a huge race riot in Chicago. Breaks out uh, July 27th, 1919. All right, so we have black migrations, which is the, which was the 2019 theme. The 2020 theme is African-Americans and the vote. African-Americans and the vote. Okay, and when you order um, the when you order the uh, fifteen DVD Black History Month bundle pack, you'll get um, these presentations in there. You get uh, my Black Migration sixteen nineteen the twenty nineteen presentation, and this is fifteen. It's actually a total of sixteen lectures that you'll get. Okay, so that's at the home. It's at our homepage uh, of AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and we'll post the link again here as well. So the 2020 theme for African American History Month is African Americans and the vote, African Americans and the vote. And once again, this is a theme to be studied throughout the year, not just in the month of February. And then November 3rd, 2020 comes, 
election day and we just forget all this stuff we studied months prior. So the 2020 theme, and let me change this here because I changed this on the second laptop. I have to update this presentation here. I should say 2020 theme. Um, so the reason why this is the 2020 theme is for a few reasons. One, we know this is a crucial election year. If you watch my videos, you know this, okay? Two, 2020 is the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment of 1870. And the 15th Amendment of 1870 guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men, not women. That's going to come with the 19th Amendment of 1920 that guarantees the right to vote for women. Nowhere, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anybody the right to vote. This is something a lot of people don't know. I did a presentation uh, this past Friday dealing with that, okay? And um, I talk about that some in, in, in this presentation I've done for African American History Month. But the year 2020 marks the centennial of the 19th Amendment and the culmination of the women's suffrage movement. The year 2020 also marks the sesquicentennial of the 15th Amendment of 1870 and the right of black men to the ballot after the, after the Civil War. The theme speaks, therefore, to the ongoing struggle on the part of both black men and black women for the right to vote. This theme has a rich and long history, which begins at the turn of the 19th century, beginning of the 1800s. In the era of the early republic with the state's passage of laws that democratized the vote for white men while disenfranchising free African-American men. Thus, even before the Civil War, Civil Wars 1861 to 1865, African-American men petitioned their legislatures and the U.S. Congress seeking to be recognized as voters. Tensions between abolitionists and women's suffragists, so women fighting for the uh, right to vote for women. Tensions between abolitionists and women's suffragists first surfaced in the aftermath of the Civil War, while African-American disenfranchisement laws in the late 19th and early 20th centuries undermined the guarantees in the 14th and 15th Amendments for the great majority of African-Americans until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Because in the 18, going to the 1890s, especially after Pledge versus Ferguson, U.S. Supreme Court case, separate and equal, separate but equal, you're going to have grandfather clauses instituted. You have, and this is going to come out of Reconstruction ending in 1877. And when Reconstruction ends with the election of Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, it was, it's called the Compromise of 1877 because neither the Republican nor Democratic candidate had enough electoral college votes to clinch the presidency. So it was a compromise. The Republicans, uh, the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes wins the presidency, but Republicans agree to remove the Union troops out of the South, and the Union troops were protecting to a certain extent the rights of African Americans, the newly free slave, newly freed slaves. So this is going to then usher in a new era of reversing this progress that African Americans were making during Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. If we understand history, and this is something I talked about in my presentation Friday, dealing with does an amendment give you the right to vote? and then with the 15th Amendment of African Americans and the vote. If we understand history, there is always a backlash to periods of time of advancement that African Americans make. Reconstruction ends in 1877 and there's a reversal of the rights of African Americans. And then we have the US Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, which really cements and ushers in the Jim Crow laws. And 
we have a continued erosion of those of those rights. We know during Reconstruction, going back to 1870, you're going to have 22 African American men who were elected to Congress. Hiram Rhodes Revels of Mississippi was the first one. He was a U.S. Senator from Mississippi. History.com has a really good article dealing with Hiram Rhodes uh, Revels. The first black man elected to Congress was nearly blocked from taking his seat because Democrats at the, at the time, so this is before the party realignment. When we talk about the party of Lincoln and Republicans, this Republican party today ain't the party of Lincoln, that's the party of Trump and Russia. Okay, the Republican party today is not the party of Lincoln, that's the party of Trump and Russia. The first black man elected to Congress was nearly blocked from taking his seat. So there's gonna be a party realignment that is going to take place decades later, the party realignment is going to be precipitated by what's known as the Lily White Movement of 1928, when Republicans are trying to get Herbert Hoover elected as president in 1929, the 1928 presidential election. Herbert Hoover is running against a Northern Democrat named Al Smith. Republicans implement a Southern strategy to, to target Southern uh, segregation as Democrats and five former Confederate states so the Republicans can win these Southern segregationist Democrats' votes. And what they're doing is what the Republicans are doing in 1928 is ignoring the issues and the pleas of African Americans and pushing African Americans out of the Republican Party by ignoring our issues. You have a rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the rise of the power of the Klan in the 1920s, precipitated by going, but precipitated by the birth of a nation movie of 1915, February 8th, 1915, which comes out 50th year anniversary of the uh, ending of the Civil War. Uh, and the 13th Amendment, all of this. This is at the beginning of the Great Migration of 1915 and 1970. This is why at the beginning I said 1915 is a pivotal year in the history of this country and a pivotal year for African Americans. And then the movie The Birth of a Nation basically rejuvenates the Ku Klux Klan which was founded 50 years prior, December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. And with this rejuvenation, they become politically powerful also. So there's uh, 1926, there's the march that they have on, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, 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 right near the White House, okay? So we're going to start over the, the over, we're going to start slowly transitioning from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Okay, this then this shift goes back to 1928 and it continues under President Roosevelt. So by 1960, two thirds of African Americans have switched over to the Democratic Party. Then it's going to continue with the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. People think that we switched parties because of the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65. No, that's not why we switched. That 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 transition goes back four decades prior, goes back to the late 1920s, and then goes into the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. You have things like the Civil Rights Act of 1957, Civil Rights Act of 1957. We go back to 1948, okay? Well, now, before 48, let's go back to 41. June 25th, 1941. Executive Order 8802, signed into law by President Franklin Roosevelt. What this did was desegregated jobs in the Department of Defense. This is during World War II, but before the U.S. gets involved in World War II, the U.S. is not going to actively, actively get involved in fighting in World War II until Pearl Harbor is bombed December 1941. Prior to that, President Roosevelt delivers his famous um, uh, presidential address dealing with the arsenal of democracy. 
And President Roosevelt says that the U.S. can become an arsenal of democracy, producing uh, and manufacturing military equipment for the Allies in World War II. So this is what happens. So you have a lot of military equipment being produced, being manufactured in this country. And then we know from 1942 to 1945, General Motors, Ford and Chrysler get massive contracts with the federal government to produce this equipment. A lot of that was taking place here in Detroit. The Guardian building in Detroit, downtown Detroit was like the headquarters of this. Okay, and then you're gonna have many African-Americans moving from the South up North coming into Detroit, moving into the Sojourner Truth Homes because the Sojourner Truth Homes are going to be a housing project created in 1942 to house African-Americans working in the, in the Department of Defense. But the, many of them are getting jobs that were desegregated because of Executive Order 8802 signed by President Roosevelt, June 25th, 1941. He didn't sign it out of the kindness of his own heart. He signed it because A. Philip Randolph, president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, leveraged his power, leveraged his position with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and he threatened to put 100,000 African Americans marching on Washington to embarrass President Roosevelt if he didn't desegregate those jobs in the Department of Defense for African Americans. So because of that, because of that threat from A. Philip Randolph, pushing an agenda, you get Executive Order 8802, which then leads to more African-Americans migrating from the South, up North, coming in, moving into middle-class neighborhood, buying homes, things like this. So you have to understand, so you have to understand this chronology of history. This is all during the Great Migration. Okay, 1915, 1970, totally changes this country. And as they move up to Detroit, as they move into Gary, Indiana, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, things like this, Chicago, Illinois, they're met with racism. And we're going to see these racial conflagrations. We're going to see these racial conflicts that are going to continue to explode. Okay. And, 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 and we know it explodes in Detroit in, I think it was June of 1943. That's the, that's the Detroit race ride in 1943. During World War II, we know about the one in 67, the 67 Rebellion. No, this is a big one. It took place in 1943 in Detroit. Okay? So, see, these are all things that we have to study and talk about during African American History Month and continue that throughout the year. So, when we look at, um, let's go back to the slide here. So this all ties into this year's annual theme of for African American History Month, which is African Americans and the Vote. Okay, African Americans and the Vote. So tensions between abolitionists and women's suffragists first surfaced in the aftermath of the Civil War, while Black disenfranchisement laws in the late 19th and early 20th centuries undermined the guarantees in the 14th and 15th Amendments for the great majority of Southern African Americans until the Voting Rights Act 1965. So what, what they're gonna implement, what various states are gonna implement in the 1890s to disenfranchise African Americans or, or what are called grandfather clauses. Grandfather clauses. The grandfather clause stipulated that if your grandfather could not vote, you can't vote. To circumvent the 15th Amendment of 1870. If you watch the movie Posse, okay, the movie Posse, uh, directed by Mario Van Peebles and star Mario, Mario Van Peebles, it came out, uh, I think it was 1995, the movie Posse. The movie Posse takes place during 1898. So when the movie opens, uh, Mario Van Peebles and others, Tiny Lister and others, um, they're involved in a war. That war is the Spanish-American War. The movie opens in 1898, okay? Even though the movie is, is I think, largely fictitious, is a, a real historical background. There's a scene in the movie uh, where Sally Richardson's character, who is, she appears to be half, I think she's half black, she, well, she's half black, half Native American. 
she talks about the grandfather clauses. Okay, when you when you watch the movie, at the beginning they have the uh, captions that talk about the history taking place there and the theft of land of African Americans after slavery took place, et cetera. Okay, and then at the end of the movie they have some captions that deal with history. The movie Posse is a real powerful movie, you know, and 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 about one third of the cowboys were African Americans. Okay. Now, if you, if you watch a lot of the Western movies and things like this, you don't get that impression. But about one-third of the cowboys were African-Americans. Even the term cowboy was a derogatory term originally that applied to African-American men who, because white men were called cattle men or cow hands. But African-American men, to denigrate them, they were called cowboys. And then that term is going to become a general term Okay, and it's not going to be derogatory, but originally, cowboys only applied to African American men as a derogatory term. Okay, let's continue here. So, this is so there's a lot of when we look at these various movies, there's a lot of history in a lot of these movies, even if, even if the movie is fictional or even if it's a mixture of history and fiction. There's still a historical background, and you, we can use that to teach. So a lot of people like the movie Posse and this action and shooting and things like this. No, but there's a deep historical background to it as well. So the important contribution of Black suffragists occurred not only within the larger women's, move, women's movement, the larger women's movement, through, um, uh, through voting rights campaigns and legal suits from the turn of the 20th century to the mid 1960s, African Americans made their voices heard as to the importance of the vote. Indeed, the fight for black voting rights continues in the courts today. And we know it continues in the courts today because you have lawsuits, whether you're dealing with gerrymandering um, or you have various lawsuits that deal with attacking the right to vote and suppressing the right to vote. And we go back to Shelby County versus Holder, U.S. Supreme Court case 2013, which gutted section five of the Voting Rights Act. Okay, and that dealt with the pre-clearance. And this is, one of the, this is one of the tactics that was used to steal the 2016 election because there were 868 fewer places to vote in 2016, 868 fewer polling places. Today, there are about 1,700 fewer polling places because what uh, the Shelby County versus Holder U.S. Supreme Court case did, that stated that the states that had a history, those Southern states, um, former Confederate states that had a history of disenfranchising African Americans, if those states wanted to make any changes to the polling locations, the uh, amount of time that uh, the number of weekends that you had souls to the polls voting, uh, the uh, hours of the, that the polls are open, things like this. If they wanted to make any changes, they had to get permission from a federal judge. That's the oversight. They had to get permission from a federal judge. Well, Shelby County versus Holder, that case weaken section five of the voting rights act so now they don't have to get the now they don't have to get the uh pre-clearance from a federal judge they can make whatever changes they want to make right after that happened all these new states started coming out with these new voter id laws okay so in 2016 there were 14 new states that had new voter id laws and they're targeting African Americans, targeting Hispanics, uh, targeting college students. They're working to suppress the vote. Many of us don't understand none of this stuff. We still talking about Gail and Oprah and a bunch of nonsense. And, and, and they're working right now to steal the 2020 election. While we are dealing with superfluous nonsense. When we look at the 191 federal judges that Donald Trump has gotten confirmed through December 2019, 191 federal judges. I was talking about 
him changing the landscape of the federal bench before a lot of people started talking about this. This, this is why Republicans worked hard and, and why they want to maintain the U.S. Senate because we don't understand Article One of the U.S. Constitution because we haven't read the Constitution. I speak across the country. Ask people who's read the Constitution. Go to loc.gov, Library of Congress website. Go to archives.gov, National Archives. Read the U.S. Constitution. Then read the Federalist Papers because the Federalist Papers help to explain the U.S. Constitution. That's the foundation of all of this. But Republicans understand, see, in 2016, well, let, let, let's, let's back up for a minute here because I'm, I'm about to wrap up because this is going longer than I actually wanted to go. Because uh, I have a ton of information here, okay? I got a ton of information, but I'm trying to keep this short. With, towards the beginning of the, of, the, of the presentation, I said, we don't understand history and we don't understand how at the when we have periods of time of progress that African Americans make, there's always a white backlash. There's always a backlash that takes place to end that progress in those periods of time, in that period of time of progress. Because we don't understand that history, we don't understand how to see it coming the next time. Therefore, we don't know what to do. So, Reconstruction ends with the Compromise of 1877. When we look at Richard Nixon becoming president in 1968, Richard Nixon ran on the platform of law and order. He was a backlash to the rebellions that were taking place among Af in, in African-American cities across the country. He was a backlash to the civil rights movement. He was a backlash to the black power movement. He ran on the platform of law and order. Law and order basically means protect white people and lock up black people. This is basically what law and order means. Then June 17th, 1971, Richard Nixon declared his war on drugs. The increase in the U.S. prison population don't start in 94 with the crime bill like people mistakenly think. It goes back two decades prior with Richard Nixon's war on drugs. The U.S. prison population more than quadruples from 1970 to 93. This is why you have to go to BJS.gov, Bureau of Justice Statistics, and look at the U.S. prison populations from 1970 to like 2016. Some reason, I could because I, I, I listen to what people say, I could tell they haven't studied this because they want to start in 94. I'm like, no, you gotta go back two decades prior. Plus, 94 crime bill that was state that was federal law not state law 87 percent of the people went to prison went under state law 94 crime bill was was federal law but, but, but we haven't done the research we just repeat stuff that we hear other people say so if we look at 2012 2012 was critical the, the 2012 presidential election because there was voter suppression that took place then. But, but because President Obama was on the ballot, there was a record number of African Americans who voted in the 2012 election. 66 point, pay attention to this, 66.6% .6 of African Americans registered to vote actually voted in the 2012 election. That was a record number that voted one, two, that was the first time in history that the percentage of African Americans who voted was higher than the percentage of white people who voted. That's the first presidential election where the percentage of African Americans who voted, percentage, uh, compared percentage of those registered to vote, the percentage of African Americans who voted was higher than the percentage of white people who vote. This scared Republicans to death. They came back the next year, Empire Strikes Black, 
Empire Strikes Black in 2013 with Shelby County versus Holt. Many of us didn't understand history enough and didn't understand the Voting Rights Act to, under, to, to see this coming and how it would impact the 2016 election and how it's going to impact 2020. So if you look at this article here from um, this is from history.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel. When did African Americans actually get the right to vote? When did African Americans actually get the right to vote? So this article is from January 29th, 2020. January 29th, 2020. Last page of the article. They have a section called Continued Challenges to Black Voting Rights. Continued Challenges to Black Voting Rights. And it says, in 2012, turnout of black voters exceeded that of white voters for the first time in history. As 66.6% .6 of eligible black voters turned out to reelect Barack Obama, the nation's first African-American president. In 2013, the Supreme Court struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act ruling five, five to four in Shelby County versus Holder that it was unconstitutional. Unconstitutional, which means it's based upon the U.S. Constitution. We don't understand this because we haven't read the Constitution. Constitution is the foundation of law in this country. Article six of the U.S. Constitution clearly tells you that the U.S. Constitution, all of the previous treaties and all of the subsequent treaties are the supreme law of the land. That's Article six, U.S. Constitution, seven articles, 27 amendments. So it's Shelby County versus Holder that it was unconstitutional to require states with a history of voter discrimination to seek federal approval before changing their election laws. In the wake of the court, in the wake of the court's decision, a number of states passed new restrictions on voting including limiting early voting and requiring voters to show photo ID. Supporters argue such measures are designed to prevent voter fraud, while critics say they, these new measures, like poll taxes and literacy tests. Before them, like poll taxes and literacy tests before them, disproportionately affect poor, elderly, black and Latino voters. So we didn't see the backlash coming for a record number of African-Americans voting in 2012. That was Shelby County versus Holder. So then 2016 was the first presidential election that you did not have the full weight, the full power of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. In 50 years, that was the first presidential election that in 50 years you didn't have the full power of the Voting Rights Act. So the 2016 election, see, I was doing nationally syndicated radio five days a week. I saw dozens of interviews with Donald Trump supporters. I saw um, over 100 interviews and campaign speeches that Trump made during the 2016 campaign cycle. Donald Trump supporters, many of them said, this is about the courts. This is about the US Supreme Court and the federal courts. Because many of the evangelicals, they've been trying to overturn Roe versus Wade since 1973. Republicans understand the courts. Most African Americans don't understand none of this stuff. Because Republicans realize that they have a shrinking party, and because white people in this country have a negative birth rate in 26 states out of 50, they realize they ain't, they're not going to win based upon population. So they have to uh, 
engage in various voter suppression tactics. So we look at this article here from the New York Times. June 20th, 2018, fewer births than deaths among whites in majority of cities. I'm not making this up. This, come, this is the U.S. Census Bureau. In the U.S., the, the, the press release from the U.S. Census Bureau came out the memo and numerous outlets picked this up. Two years prior to this, in 2016, it was 17 states out of 50. Today is 26 states out of 50. The Census Bureau has projected that whites could drop below 50% of the population around 2045, a relatively slow moving change that has been years in the making. But a new report this week found that whites are dying faster than they are being born now in 26 states up from 17 just two years earlier. And demographers say that shift might come even sooner. So now they're saying the year is 2043. This all deals with the fear of the browning of America. This is why the 2020 census is so important. This is why the Trump administration tried to put the uh, citizenship question on the census. There hasn't been a citizenship question on the census in about 70 years. Because if you understand the U.S. census created by the U.S. Constitution, the first census taken in 1790, the, 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 the Constitution specifically states that the census is to count everybody in the country. Doesn't matter whether they are uh, here legally, undocumented, what have you. They could be going through the process. Doesn't matter. The census is designed to count everybody in the country, period. This goes back to the, the, the census is created by the U.S. Constitution. And the census ties into funding. The census ties into um, representation in the House of Representatives, okay? And it, it ties into the redrawing of congressional districts, which is done by the state legislature. And it ties into the Electoral College. And this is what people don't understand. So when you talk about putting a, a citizenship question on the U.S. Census, you have a lot of households in various cities in various states where you will have people living in the household, some who are here legally and some who are undocumented for whatever reason. And I got a big problem with certain people calling other people illegal. When you study the history of this country and the theft of approximately 2.3 billion acres of land, one way or another, from Native Americans and African people who are already here. So I have a big problem when certain people want to call other people illegal. That's a whole nother presentation. The number of seats in the House of Representatives a state has is based upon the population count coming from the U.S. Census. When the state, when the city of Detroit dropped under 1 million in population, I think it was right around 2000, I think it was around 2000, uh, the year 2000, we lost a lot of federal funding and we lost a congressional seat we lost a congressional seat, which means we lost uh, a seat in the House of Representatives. Well, how does this impact the Electoral College? I thought that uh, it doesn't matter who you vote for. That's what you hear a lot of these simple Simon ass people saying. Oh, I thought the Electoral College chose the president. The, 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 we don't choose the president, the Electoral College chooses the president. Do you realize I ain't hear one Donald Trump supporter say that in 2016, they said we voting for Donald Trump. Only people I heard say stupid ass stuff like that were black people. I, did, I saw dozens of interviews with Donald Trump supporters in 2016. None of them said, we don't choose the president, the Electoral College chooses the president. They said we vote for Donald Trump. They didn't, none of them said the popular vote doesn't matter. It's the Electoral College vote. They, that's, not what, that's not what they said. If you actually understand the Electoral College, you understand the popular vote does matter. It's the popular vote per state. This is why Republicans engaged in rampant voter suppression 
in key battleground states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. They understand this. We don't. So how does this tie into the Electoral College? Well, how many Electoral College votes does it take to become president-elect? 270. So how do you get to 270 Electoral College votes? You have to win the Electoral College votes associated with a state. How do you win the Electoral College votes associated with a state? By winning the popular vote in the state. It's the popular vote per state that matters, not the overall popular vote. Well, what does this have to do with the census? What this has to do with the census is representation in the House of Representatives is based upon population. The more people you have counted for your state and your city in the U.S. Census, the more seats in the House of Representatives you will have. So California has 55 Electoral College votes. They have 53 seats in the House of Representatives. Washington, uh, if we look at Vermont and Maine, they have three Electoral College votes. They have uh, one seat in the House of Representatives. We look at the state of Michigan. Michigan has 16 Electoral College votes. So Michigan has 14 seats in the House of Representatives. Texas has 38 Electoral College votes. So they have 36 seats in the House of Representatives. You take the number of seats in the House of Representatives, you add to that the number of U.S. Senators each state has, based upon the U.S. Constitution, uh, each seat, I think it's Article 1, each, seat has, uh, each state has two U.S. Senators. That tells you how many electoral college votes a state has. Well, if you put a citizenship question on, a, on the census and you have various households where they have some people who live in that household who are here legally, others who are undocumented, they may not fill out the census form and turn it in at all, which means you're going to have a drop in, in certain states and certain cities in U.S. census count, which then means they could lose representation in the House of Representatives. They will lose seats. They will lose a congressional district, which then means it reduces how many electoral college votes those states have. Those states are more likely to be Democratic-leaning states as opposed to Republican leaning states, which means it makes it harder for those states to choose a Democratic president, which then helps Republicans and helps change the balance of power in the Electoral College with one question on the census that many people still don't even understand. That's what this is about. And this is about understanding, planning 25, 30, 35 years ahead and also gaining control of the courts because it's the, it's the president who nominates the U.S. Supreme Court justices and nominates the federal judges. It's the U.S. Senate that confirms them. This is what Moscow Mitch McConnell, this is his number one goal, to get as many unqualified conservative judges approved that they can get approved because they're focusing on controlling the courts for the next 25, 30, 35 years, because they know they ain't going to win the population race. They're not going to win that, so they're going to focus on controlling the courts. Many African Americans don't understand this. We, we don't realize they're planning 25, 30, 35 years ahead, because we're focusing on first of the month to the end of the month, first of the month to the end of the month. I understand survival but we have to understand history and law. So that teaches you how to navigate. All right, Sherry, Mildred, Mo, how's everybody doing? Okay, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, also uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. You can set up for a recurring donation, one-time donation, $25, $50, $100, whatever it is. That helps us keep doing the research, finance the African History Network, pay the bills, et cetera. It helps when they have to speak out of town also. All of my DVD lectures are at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. We have the uh, 
Black History Month 15 DVD bundle pack also that's on sale hundred dollars. It's regularly I think like two fifty, something like that. And um you can advertise with the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AE. Oh, see, customer service at African History Network.com. Email me customer service at African History Network.com. Okay. And we have a um, couple of new advertisers um, as well. Um, a, lot of Af a lot of people are getting into shape for 2020. And we know African American women do work out. They're not going to let their hair stop them from working out. She ran herself fit.com can help you with this. Now she ran herself fits mission is to inspire and motivate women to make healthy lifestyle changes. She ran herself fit is a brand that promotes women living a healthy lifestyle by making small sacrifices in our daily routine and changing our diet. We can combat many of the different diseases that are prevalent in the black community. The owner of she ran herself fit. Her name is Felicia. She lost over 200 pounds by changing her diet and running. Running may not be your motivation, but find what drives you to be fit. She ran herself fit apparel can be purchased at she ran herself fit.com. Let them know you found out about this from the African history network. Okay. Now speaking of running, you need shoes to run in. Well, the wide shoe outlet can help you. You can order shoes from around the country. Visit simplywide.com, simplywide.com. They also have a brick and mortar store in Marlow Heights, Maryland, located at 4279 Branch Avenue in Marlow Heights, Maryland. Give them a call, 301-702-1401. 301-702-1401. They have men's and women's sizes in shoes up to 15 double E. They carry brands like Naturalizer, Soft Spots, Ross Homerson, Pro Pet, Walking Cradles, and Easy Street. Okay. Uh, visit their website, simplywide.com. Simplywide.com. That is the wide shoe outlet. Now, many African-Americans in 2020 want to get their credit in order. They want to buy a house, finance a car. Chandranette Middleton at rrrcreditservices.com can help you with this. If you're, it's RRR Credit Services is your one stop when it comes to credit education and repair. They equip you by providing solutions which will enable you to rebuild your financial future. Uh, the affordable cost to become a new client is just $30 for the first month. Take the first step by giving them a call at 1-800-607-1989. 1-800-607-1989 for a free credit consultation. 1-800-607-1989. Also visit their website, rrrcreditservices.com and either Chandra Nett or one of her assistants will be able to assist you. Let them know you found out about this from the African History Network. Okay, so let's continue. We'll be here for a few more minutes. Um, all right, so these are, these are the types of things that we need to discuss during African American History Month. This ties into the annual theme. The annual theme gives direction, it gives purpose, and it gives direction on what to focus on for the rest of the year. When we look at the annual theme for 2020 African Americans and the vote, and they also have it at asala.org, asala.org, you can have programs and lectures and things like this throughout the year dealing with different aspects of that annual theme, okay? So this is bigger than just talking about runaway slaves and um, African Americans who invented things that white people could steal the patents from or uh, make white people's lives easier. All right, this, is, this ain't about the first Negro to do this, first Negro to do that. That's part of our history, but that, that's not the focus of Black History Month, African American History Month. The way we commemorate this and celebrate this is, is backwards. I mean, this is like really as backwards, okay? All right, let's look at some of your comments here. Uh, be sure to listen to the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. on uh, 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF. And we broadcast on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network also when we're on live. Uh, 
All right, so check out these articles um, as well that I, that I gave you. And then uh, look at this article also from NBCnews.com. A uh, tidal wave of voter suppression washes out over uh, states, lawyer says. Tidal wave of voter suppression washes out, uh, washes over states, lawyer says. Uh, let's, let's try to bring this up here. And this is from NBCnews.com, February 3rd, 2020. So February 3rd was the 150th anniversary of the uh, ratification of the 13th Amendment, okay? Uh, that was February 3rd, 1870. So there were a number of articles uh, written um, February 3rd, 2020. There were a number of articles written dealing with uh, this history here, okay? Let's see, is this coming up? Okay. All right. Let's try to bring this up. Uh, I want to show you this slide here. Running slowly for some reason right now. But uh, this article, Tidal Wave of Voter Suppression Washes Over States, uh, Lloyd says, is from February 3rd, 2020, and it talks about the, the voter suppression that's taking place and the various court cases. Okay. If you watch Roland Martin Unfiltered, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, on Roland's Facebook page and YouTube channel, and we share the broadcast on our fan page, the African History Network. He does a good job of covering a lot of these stories. All right, so this is uh, this is not coming up. Okay. But uh, yeah, read this article though. Uh, Tidal wave of voter suppression washes over states, lawyer says. Okay, and this gives some uh, background information of what's going on as well. Okay, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow people to do to you and get away with is based on what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself, okay? Uh, follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, on YouTube. Uh, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. We have audio podcasts of our shows also. When you go to africanhistorynetwork.com, uh, click on the link, listen to podcasts. Uh, of the uh,